Today's conversation revolves around a lot of the core concepts that are included in the second course of our MBA, MGA designation program. Uh, there was a link that was sent to you on the invite, and there will be a link that will be sent to you uh, with this recording. Uh, but there's also a link in the chat right now if you are looking to check out that program. Uh, but I would uh, recommend maybe you wait till the end uh, so that you don't miss any of our conversation. First of all, I'd like to start off with um, what I see as the biggest difference between MGAs and retail brokers. And I've heard it referred to as a mindset shift. And I know that mindset shift takes place uh, for the MGA as well as for the carrier. Cam, I was hoping we could start with you. And I'd like to specifically talk about from an MGA perspective, if you could describe what that mindset shift looks like and what role does delegated authority play in that? Sure, Brad. I think at the heart of it, a broker's role is to give customers choice and advice and to focus on sales and service. Brokers are paid a commission on the premium and there's a heavy emphasis on sales and underwriting choices are left to the carrier. The carrier's role is to price and select risk to achieve a target loss ratio. Carriers are paid on underwriting profit and investment income. So while they are motivated to sell, they're primarily concerned with profit. Brokers often have varying degrees of delegation from carriers, which start to shift the mindset from sales to underwriting profit generation. Even a line guide delegation with fixed rates and terms offers the broker an ability to service customers faster and in return, a responsibility to execute the carrier's risk selection plan. However, these delegations often only allow for limited rate variation and strict terms and conditions of coverage but they often do include a profit commission, which rewards the broker for choosing target and appropriate risks over any and all risks. The MGA on other hand, has full delegation or delegated authority. This allows freedom of rate and form to various degrees. And in this case, the MGA is acting as a fully outsourced risk acceptance and pricing arm of the carrier. Sometimes this even extends to claim services and an MGA may have settlement authority up to certain prescribed conditions and limits. So an MGA can not only price and bind a carrier to the risk, but also settle a claim on the carrier's behalf. You can see that this would bring a very high standard of responsibility on behalf of the MGA and a much higher level of scrutiny and supervision by the insurer. Having this increased level of flexibility and the closeness to the customer and emerging needs allows the MGA to be innovative and responsive. Now they can not only see the need, but act to fill it. This also brings a high degree of accountability and scrutiny, but I think this is the mindset that you're, that you're speaking of. And there are inherent conflicts in the MGA model that require a mindset shift too. The MGA works on commission and is motivated to sell, but they will not renew their agreements if they're not profitable, so they're motivated by profitability as well. Getting that balance right over the long, over the long term can be tricky and difficult. Another mindset regarding MGAs that we're seeing today is the recognition of the MGA as a viable and long-term industry participant or the fourth industry player, I've heard you refer to it as. In this capacity, MGAs fill a vital role, allowing entrepreneurism to meet market needs. And I think it's an exciting time for MGAs in Canada with the Insurance Institute offering a designation path and a revitalized association in CAMGA. Well, excellent. That's a, that's a good oversight of that mindset shift. Thank you. Now at Cancer, you're dealing with both Lloyd's as well as domestic carriers. And I'm wondering if there's any difference in the delegated authority when it comes to Lloyd versus a domestic carrier. Yeah, I think one of the fundamental differences is that domestics like to write standard business themselves and they see MGAs as a way to participate in non-standard business by taking a quota share interest as opposed to writing 100% of the risk. But MGAs also write a lot of standard business. They do it on service speed, on relationship, or by writing challenging risk and earning a broker's loyalty. Lloyd see that too and view MGAs as a way to participate in some standard business in a country like Canada, and also to gain access to non-standard and innovative business on a quota share basis. But the really hard to place business, Lloyd's likes to write directly in their open market operations, especially in a hard market like we're in now. So domestics and Lloyds play together in a market like we have now where domestics write standard business, MGAs write standard and non-standard business and truly hard to place business is written in the Lloyds op 
open market, often through the MGA as the intermediary. Fundamentally, domestic delegation and Lloyd's delegation are very similar. Both are contractual extensions of underwriting and claims operations. Both require supervision and scrutiny by the insurer. But one difference is that Lloyd's has a consistent framework to manage delegated authorities, whereas each domestic takes a homegrown approach. Another difference is that Lloyd's rights or domestics rights sorry, on a continuous basis and Lloyd's rights on fixed contract terms. But even domestics will evaluate performance annually. So there isn't that much practical difference in the end. Okay. Okay. And in your um, answer there, you talked about the hard market. And I was wondering if you could give us a, maybe put some color around how uh, the MGA's role, or your role, has shifted as we move from a soft market to a hard market, if you can remember what the soft market was like. But could you put some color around that? Yeah, I still have the scars, Brad. Um, MGAs serve the area between standard and non-standard risk very well. As the market changes from soft to hard, the appetite of insurers becomes more limited and their posture towards growth shifts more to retention and rate increase over new policy acquisition. A lot of risks that were in target for insurers become underserved. This can leave brokers short of markets, short of choice options, and short of insuring partners willing to put the work into underwriting a risk. Those are very much conditions that MGAs serve well, and brokers may turn towards MGAs to meet their needs. The MGA model of subscribing risk across multiple insurers allows them to continue to attract capital, which has become risk adverse. And if supported by strong expertise and proven performance, they can be a much needed source of stability in a turbulent market. Additionally, MGAs can offer wholesale placement for brokers into non-traditional carriers, the Lloyd's open market, or new carriers whom the broker may, broker may not be otherwise able to access. This too can help to stabilize accounts and give market certainty. Perfect. And that's what we're talking about, certainty and uncertain times. Uh, if I could shift the conversation now, I'd like to come to you, Mark, and ask uh, if you could shed some light on the percentage of business or if the appeal for what amount of business comes to the delegated authority piece with Lloyd's in Canada. Yeah, absolutely, Brad. I mean, and it's, it's, you know, it's a significant amount of business. Um, so if you think about Lloyd's uh, total gross rate premium in Canada for 2020, that came out at about 4.4 billion in total. And if you exclude the reinsurance business from that number, um, you sit at about 4.1 billion. And over half of that, I'd say close to 2.4 billion of that was, um, was business via delegated authority with our cover holders here in Canada. Um, I guess, you know, as a matter of trending, that, that's about 8% growth um, just in 2020 and 2019 numbers. So um, a, a real healthy portion of Lloyd's business, um, a channel that we're committed to and we continue to see um, prospects for good growth this year and beyond. Oh, certainly sounds like it. Um, now, what impact has the hard market had when it comes to people looking for delegated authority? Um, are you seeing a change in interest and is that driven by the hard market when you talk about that 8% growth? Or is it driven by the innovation we see coming out of the MGA space? Could you give some idea on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I think there's, there's a little bit of both of those things going on to be you know, very honest about it. Um, admittedly, the last couple of years have seen some disruption in, in the delegated authority space. I think um, certainly Lloyd's and, and, and domestic carriers out of necessity um, and the drive for profitability has, has made them more disciplined around delegated authority, uh, the need for profitable results from, from their MGA partners. Um, but the hard market's also created, I think, um, opportunities for MGAs with, with, as Cam mentioned, you know, track records of, of profitable programs and an ability to, to exercise disciplined underwriting. So I think, you know, looking at the space over the longer term, it, it, it's absolutely the entrepreneurial drive of MGAs and their expertise um, that's resulted in, in the growth. And I think it's, you know, if you track it for long enough over say seven, eight years, it, it's almost a hundred percent growth. Oh. Um, and I think it's true that profitability issues have forced a number of traditional carriers to retrench their risk appetite and withdraw from certain sectors of the market. And, and you know, MGAs have really been able to step up and fill that void to their credit. But, but, but real kind of long-term growth of MGAs comes from, from 
product innovation, from the ability to be much more nimble, to identify profitable market segments and niches that traditional carriers either aren't able or willing to fill and to really capitalize in, in those spaces. Yeah, and, and it's really on that last part about that innovation and moving the market forward and trying to find new areas. Um, that, that's where I see that growth coming in the MBA market as well. I was wondering, uh, Cam did a good job of covering off what the mindset shift is from an MBA's perspective. I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could put some color on that around the mindset shift that happens as a carrier. I mean, you're yeah, yeah. I mean, it, sure, and, and I, you know, I absolutely think there is, you know, a significant mind shift that that has to take place um, from a carrier's perspective to really be successful and, and sustain um, a delegated authority model. Uh, you know, um, it, it requires a mind shift. Traditionally, underwriting is the core function of, of, the, of a carrier of an insurance company, right? I mean, you kind of pare down everything else. It, it's all about um, underwriting expertise. And, and with the um, delegated authority and the MGA model, carriers are literally delegating their underwriting authority, and albeit within prescribed boundaries, but they're delegating their underwriting authority to MGAs. And that's not typically in their comfort zone, right? It's, it's not um, the traditional division of, of labor and, and responsibilities that, that they're used to. So, so I think carriers who engage in the delegated authority model successfully, um, not only do they have to really embrace and adopt a, a, the different mindset, but, but they also have to develop a whole suite of expertise and different competencies. They, they have to be, um, they have to become experts at portfolio management. They, they need to, they need the right kind of business processing capabilities. Um, they need the right sort of skills and expertise around third party governance and audit services. So, so it's mind shift and, and a whole different competency or set of competencies that's essential to really succeed. Okay. And again, you mentioned that mindset shift. Um, do you feel that there's any difference in uh, a domestic carrier's risk profile versus how Lloyd's looks at some of those different risks? Well, I, you know, I mean, individual risk appetites change um, from carrier to carrier, and, and even Lloyd's, right, is, is, is actually a marketplace of, of 80 different risk appetites. Um, and, and so I don't, you know, don't necessarily comment too much on, on domestic carriers, but um, I can say, you know, commit, committing to the delegated authority model of underwriting and embracing the delegated authority model as a core distribution channel is at the heart of what Lloyd's has been doing literally for decades, right? So, um, so I think fundamentally for most domestic carriers, delegate authority is, is not part of their core business model. I mean, if they do it, it kind of sits off to the side. Um, if it's running all right, then that's okay. If you hit a hard market, if you hit challenge, it's, it's usually the first thing that comes under scrutiny and perhaps um, under the ax, frankly. Um, their underwriters typically do the underwriting, you know, because they're used to doing it in-house. That, that's never really been the case at Lloyd's. And, and that's, that's why, uh, you know, I think Lloyd's has embraced and excelled at the delegated authority model. Perfect. Okay. And uh, this next question is kind of a two-part question. So I'm going to ask you, Mark, first, and then I'm going to ask Paul if you could jump in. Uh, Mark, if I'm a broker, and I wanted to get delegated authority from Lloyd Canada. I was hoping you could give me a bit of an idea of what that process might look like. And then Paul, if you could also add your commentary about what it is that Lloyd's is looking for in prospective cover holders. So Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, um, and, and I'll, no, I'll, I'll keep it at, at a fairly high general level, but I mean, you know, the, the first thing I would suggest or recommend is, um, you know, Best, best to come with uh, a really kind of solid business plan about what you want to underwrite and what you want to use Lloyd's capacity for. And, and obviously, um, you know, when you're articulating a plan that, that has innovation as a core component or really um, responds to an underserviced area or niche of the market, um, you know, that, that's always, I guess, preferable in the sense that it will at least differentiate your, your application um, 
from that of others. But, but really, it begins with, with finding a Lloyd's accredited broker, um, explaining to them, getting buy-in from them about the business model. <clears throat> then that Lloyd's broker is actually able to assist an MGA to shop the opportunity around the Lloyd's market um, with different managing agents, with all the different syndicates, and really find a match in terms of um, risk appetite and, and desire, right, for, for a syndicate to grant that delegated authority. There's a whole series of, of requirements to be met. There, there is certainly some paperwork involved, but it's really about, you know, I'm finding a Lloyd's broker that will help sell and, and um, push the, the proposition forward within the marketplace to find the right sponsorship. Okay, and Paul, would you be able to add some color to that from the Lloyd's perspective on what you're looking for in prospective cover holders? Yeah, absolutely, Brad. So, um, I mean, just picking up really on what Mark was saying, um, obviously the first step is is to is to find the right right market connections. But what my team in London does is that we 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 centrally approve um, cover holders, um, M MGA MGA partners, and with Canada we will do that very closely with with Mark and and his team. I suppose the first thing just to say is that we really see being a Lloyd's cover holder as being a, a gold standard of quality. You know, it's something that we're incredibly proud of, our network of cover holders in Canada, and indeed, indeed globally as well. You know, it's a it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic network. And um, and as we've heard, it supports so much of our business. Um, and also just picking up on what Mark was saying, what are really the, the key things that we look for when we come to approve a cover holder? Well, there are some some sort of quite specific things that we check around solvency, making sure that premiums will be properly protected with trust accounts and so on. We look at levels of professional indemnity insurance and, and, and some other controls. But at the heart of it, I'd say there are really five things that we really want to get under the skin of. First is to understand that business model. Um, and what is it that you're bringing, you're bringing to, 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 to the Lloyd's market? And that's why not only when you come to us, um, would you normally have a Lloyd's broker um, supporting you in that process? But we'd also expect at that point you to have a syndicate because it's very much going to be a partnership between the syndicate and between, between the cover holder. And, and, and together, we want to understand what that business model is and also understand that there's the right expertise to support, to support that type of, type of business. Absolutely critical to us. Second, we want to understand the 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 the, the fitness and, and propriety of of the of the cover holder, and also the people who who own it, control it, your 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 directors, and so on. Why does this matter to, matter so much to us? Well, once you become a Lloyd's cover holder, you have our brand, you have our logo, um, you can you can use our our, our ratings, um, and you have access to to our to our market. So it's really important to us that we know the people who, who are coming into our market and are going to be able to use, use our brand. So we do want to understand um, a, a little bit about, about, about the people who are going to be running, running our cover holders. Third, we need to make sure that you've got the right operating mm -hmm. systems. So oftentimes we will obviously have that conversation around what the, what the underwriting side is, what, 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 is the, what, what is that proposition? But we do need to understand that as a cover holder, you've got the right um, operating systems, both in terms of the front end, in terms of your, 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 your trading platform, how are you going to actually um, interact with retail brokers or indeed potentially with, with, with customers directly. But also, have you got the right operating platform to be able to interface with your Lloyd's partners, with your London partners, and in particular, provide the key data that allows them to oversee the business, um, which which is which is which is so important. So we will check to make sure that that a cover holder has all of those 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 systems systems in place. Um, fourth, the regulatory approval, local compliance, absolutely critical. <coughs> it really links on to what I was just saying, which is you know you've got our name, you our our our, our licenses. You know we we we're, we're centrally licensed, so it's so important to us. That we understand that you really 
um, as, as a cover holder, understand not only the, the relevant laws and regulations where you are, but if, 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 you're, if you're trading outside your own, your own province um, and, or indeed internationally, the, the, the you, under, you understand what that means as well. And then fifth, and absolutely critical to me, is that we understand what your value is in the distribution chain. Um, so, you know, to put it in its most blunt, what, what is it that the carrier is paying for? Um, what is the work transfer that is moving from the carrier to the cover holder? Um, and, and, to, and to really understand that, because we all know, whether it's Lloyd's or whether it's other carriers, the focus on expenses is really clear. And it's really important that everybody understands um, what, what 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 the what the money what the money is, is is going on, and actually that can generate a really positive conversation around what the role in the distribution chain is and what the role in the value chain is. So those are the things that we we try to get under the skin of when when a cover holder comes to us. And what we often find is that actually the process of having those conversations can really start to distill what the value is of that cover holder. And it, it often is actually a really positive experience for everyone involved that, that lots of those things get really crystallized and worked through as part of that approval process. Excellent. Well, that sounds like quite a complex process. I was wondering if you could uh, answer how long does that generally take for somebody to move through and when you talk about processes, I've heard John Neal speak about the need to reduce um, uh, expenses, essentially. And I was wondering, will those processes change uh, for somebody looking for comfort holder status in the future, Lloyds? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, how long it takes at the moment, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to say because it will vary on so many um so many so many variables and what i would say is that to, to 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 get it to go quickly the sooner that you can have the conversations with a potential lloyds broker and and if it's lloyds with 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 mark and his team then then that that will will assist we 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 have we have a we have an sla for a brand new cover holder and we we, we aim to to do that within 20 days but in order to get to that stage you need to make sure that that, that, that all the information is ready so it it, it can vary sometimes it can it can take some time, but equally, um, recently we, we, we're starting to pilot some processes whereby we can we can really turn this around um, very 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 quickly. So it all depends how ready are you? Have you got? Uh, and we're absolutely transparent about what the questions are. Look at those questions, work them through, and the more information, the clearer you are as an applicant, the quicker the process will be. But it is important to us that we continue to make the journey for cover holders easier and better and, and more, more efficient because there is um, quite a lot of, 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 of administration that, that's, that's currently, currently in the process. And um, we are uh, in the middle of a really exciting strategy called Future at Lloyd's, which is looking to um, transform our market into a data first, digital enabled marketplace and we absolutely aspire to be um, the world's most advanced insurance marketplace and our future at Lloyd strategy is is key to that and so a little bit of a plug here um, please do take a look at Lloyd's website where you'll find a lot of information um, about about what we're what we're doing but what I'm really pleased about and really excited about is that some of the um, um, most uh, so, so, so some of the first things that will come out of that process are very much related to supporting our cover holder and DA DA community. So, for instance, um, the, the 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 system that we use at the moment to approve new cover holders um, is being replaced, um, and it will be replaced by the, by the middle of this year. And and it particularly in the in its first uh, release will focus on the on the registration of the what we call binding authority contracts which are the delegated um, contracts to 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 cover holders and what will be um, incredibly exciting is this is going to have our first generation of the contract builder functionality so often what takes time to um, get 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 up and running is having the actual um, authority document the binding authority in place and we're, we're creating our first generation of, of a binder creation tool as part of our, our, our new, new, new system. So as I say, it's all about 
making sure that we have um, a data first and digital engagement with with our with our cover holders and building systems and solutions um, that that's, that's, that support that. Um, one other thing that I'm that I'm, I must mention because I was mentioning a moment ago about the need to have the right operating platforms um, and 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 often that can be the area where we will have the most conversations throughout the approval process. So I'm delighted to say that we've actually created um, a, a, a system that we call Coverholder Workbench. Um, it's, it's absolutely um, optional for cover holders. But if, you, if you're thinking about becoming an MGA, if you're thinking about becoming a cover holder and you need a um, quick to market solution that will allow you to quote and bind, create uh, um, policy production and link to our, our back office reporting systems, then Coverholder Workbench is, is available and to have a conversation with your syndicates and brokers and, and, and that may be, may be a, a solution, solution for you. Um, then the final thing that I wanted to mention, and it really um, follows on from what Cameron was saying about one of the differences between Lloyd's and the company market is um, we do have this issue, uh, uh, this, this, this current model where we have the annual binding authority contracts by moving to a data first world where we will use and really understand data, we think we can actually support um, continuous binders at Lloyd's. Um, now, this will be a journey. This will take, the, there, there are a number of things that we need to work through, um, but by making sure that, that we, we're using data to really understand performance, we think that we can start on the journey towards continuous binding authority contracts. And that's something that I'm particularly passionate about trying to, to, to push forward. So we're gonna start off probably with some relatively simple examples of where that might work, and then we'll, we'll, we'll work, it, work it out from there. So there's a lot of great stuff. Have a look at the Future at Lloyd's website and um, hopefully, hopefully it'll bring it to life. Excellent, thank you. That is a lot of uh, a lot of processes, a lot of systems uh, discussion, but it sounds like it's moving in the right direction from a process improvement standpoint. If you've got a question here, and I don't know who would like to grab this, but uh, the question is, would you need a London broker in process if you have direct market avenues? Anybody like to? Um, well, uh, let me let me answer what I think the question is, um, and maybe if, if I get it wrong, I'm happy to, to be corrected by our, our person posing the question. Um, do you need a London broker? I, I think, you know, as part of the delegated authority process, if, if perhaps you already have open market correspondent, um, if you already have access to the Lloyd's market um, through manner other than delegated authority, and, and, and I think the answer is yes, you would. I mean, it's seen really is a sort of different kind of business, um, different requirements around it. You know, it probably means you're already transacting with certain London brokers, sorry, Lloyd's brokers. So they're a great place to start. Um, also, you know, Brad probably should have mentioned, forgive me, but uh, of course, you know, if, if you're not familiar with a number of Lloyd's brokers and don't really know where to start in that process, um, that's absolutely why Lloyd's has people like myself here. Um, my colleague who's also on, on the webinar, Asima Zahid, leads our market development practice in Canada. She's very much tapped into that and can help um, make the kinds of introductions that might be useful to different Lloyd's brokers, depending upon the business opportunity that a Canadian MGA is, is thinking about trying to develop. Um, but I, I hope that helps a little bit with the question. If I'm interpreting it correctly. Okay, thank you. And uh, if whoever asked the question uh, had any follow-up, uh, please feel free to add that in. I was uh, wanting to bring it back to you, Cam. From your perspective, you're hearing a lot about uh, what Lloyd's is doing for the future. But from your perspective as an MGA, what do you see as the future of the marketplace? The future of MGAs? Yeah. You know, I, I think the basic reasons MGAs exist are not going away, although they will likely change shape over time. Um, if we think of why MGAs exist, there's efficient distribution for carriers who are looking for aggregation, the need for carriers to subscribe in volatile segments and for brokers to still get a one-stop shop experience. 
the ease of market entry for capital without an established foothold or brand in the marketplace, the ease of placement for brokers who need a supplier who tries harder, works to fill gaps, rolls up their sleeves to bring an entrepreneurial approach to service, um, the need for viable choice between brands and differentiated offerings, and innovation. And there is no, no shortage of the need for flexible, visionary innovation, the true essence of the entrepreneurial opportunity. Just think of what's going on around us right now that the industry is barely grappling with. We've got you know, emerging risk in crypto and Bitcoin, blockchain, non-fungible tokens, carbon credits. We've got clean tech and weather risk, parametric insurance. We've got pay by use, pay in the product, you know, the gig economy, micro insurance, dollars or a few pennies per transaction insurance, e-commerce and digital distribution, digital service models, AI in all facets from chatbots and digital assistants to algorithms and big data analytics and shifting points of risk transfer driven by the internet of things, automation, interconnectivity and algorithmically derived behavior of devices and programs. And let's not forget drones and industrial robots and even automated medical devices and diagnostics. So there will need to be innovation. There will need to be trial and error and gap coverage while the big players digest these changes. There will be intended and unintended consequences. <coughs> Criminals and competitors will look to exploit these changes. And I think MGAs are, are the ideal platform to tackle the challenge of ensuring this kind of change and uncertainty with energy and enthusiasm and entrepreneurism. But when you uh, list that list of uh, emerging risks, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's quite impressive. Uh, any one of those I think is a, an entire uh, market segment and you just listed off about 20 of them. So that's impressive. And, yeah, uh, obviously we can have a follow-up webinar of... on, we can have a follow-up <laughs> webinar on emerging risk. and. <laughs> Well, I, and I know having uh, heard uh, Mark and his Lloyd's team talk about innovation at Lloyd's, uh, that would certainly be a uh, full conversation. And, and actually following up from that, Mark, when you hear Cam talk about all of that specialization that's going on in the marketplace, uh, do you see that driving the growth of the MG market space in the future? Um, and does that really suit Lloyd's appetite more so than a domestic carrier? Yeah, I mean, Brent, no, I, I absolutely think the specialization, it's not only driving the growth of the MJ market, I, I think it's occurring throughout the industry. I'm just generally speaking, uh, you know, um, I think it's a fact that to deliver consistently profitable results, you, you have to be an expert in the business and in the market segments that you're serving. Um, explosion, to, to me, the explosion of NGAs, um, is proof of that phenomenon, right? That that um, you just, you need that extra degree of uh, specialization of knowledge and and just focus. So um, I I, you know, I I just I don't think that that generally carriers have the resources to do that, and they, they can't become experts in in all the segments of the economy. Not even all the segments the CAM just list, listed, um, and and the fact that you know. Absolutely, that that fact absolutely contributes to the proliferation of MGAs in Canada, right? They're just they're just picking up all of the really interesting niches that carriers can't or won't or aren't able to do so, and and they're exploiting it um, tremendously. So so you know how, how does that play to Lloyd's or how does Lloyd's respond to that? Um, I you know I think Lloyd's is, is effectively built for specialization because. Um, Lloyd's comprises 80 odd carriers, each with their own series of risk appetites, segment focuses and, and expertise, right? We, we are not just one domestic carrier and we're not just one set of risk appetites. Um, and, and, you know, so, so I think in fact, the drive to specialization that's occurring in, in Canada right now absolutely plays to the strength of what Lloyd's is. It, it's, it is our kind of unique value proposition. Um, it's, it's the strength and diversity of the Lloyd's marketplace. So I think we're set up you know, just where we need to be at the right time to really support the MGA industry here in Canada. And, and when you talk about the MGA industry in Canada, I heard something and it might've been through conversations with Camga. They were talking about the growth of MGAs in the US marketplace. And um, I think they've grown from 10% to closer to 
20 or 25 percent of the marketplace and in canada i don't think we're anywhere near that 20 to 25 percent but could you see that explosion taking us from where we are today which i think is around 10 to 12 percent up to that 25 percent or do you think it might be a little less i know i'm asking to look into a crystal ball and cam i'll ask yeah. for your comments on this as well but where do you see that growth going um you know i I'm sure Cam knows. He's much smarter than I am. Um, but you know, I, I don't know about an exact number. I, I absolutely see that there's a there's a huge amount of runway ahead for MGAs. Um, I think you know they will particularly grow at an accelerated pace while this hard market continues, and then they will grow at a healthy pace even after you know the hard market is officially over, um, because you know. There's only so many carriers, frankly, in Canada, um, so many expertise and underwriters. I think the demand will continue to evolve and um, specialize and, and MGAs will be the parties who are there to respond to that. They have the right scale to be innovative, to be responsive in a timely way, the way often carriers can't, quite frankly, you know, it, it's a little bit like the analogy of, of trying to to turn a super carrier, a super tanker, as opposed to you know a, a power boat, it's just it's just hard for carriers to really respond to the same pace of change that goes on in the economy in different segments. And so I, I see the future and the growth for MGAs as, as very positive in Canada. Glenn and Cam, do would you like to add any commentary to that? Obviously, with the list you you gave us, you see a huge opportunity ahead. But uh, how, how would you put that, how would you quantify that opportunity in those percentages? I can't quantify it, but I'll, I'll share some thoughts. And just so the audience knows, Mark's one of the people I call when I need answers. So, <laughs> um, and, and, and Rob, I'll speak to your question that you posted in the Q&A, because I think this is all dancing around the same themes. You know, I see a gap opening in the industry. Uh, competitive scale for an insurer now is north of $2 billion. That leaves a huge market space for underserved risk and for new entrants. And who are those new entrants going to be? Nobody's standing up an insurance company today to write $100 million worth of business. It's not economically feasible. So that, though, that level of brand and market entry and, and investment is really coming in through the MGA channels. So I see MGAs bringing brand differentiation and choice and new entrants, and this gets on the innovation and responsiveness to new need um, in that market entry phase, but also up to five, six hundred million dollars to occupy that small company space that used to be occupied by for-profit insurers, stock and mutual companies, which are all now north of two billion, heading for four billion for economic scale. So the other part of Rob's question was, do I see a, a, something similar to an excess and surplus and lines market in Canada long term? I don't see it in the structural sense that they have it in the US with the admitted and non-admitted structural differences, but I do think we already have it in Canada. And I think that's what gives longevity to this MGA cover holder model, filling these needs around the core appetites of insurers. I think a, you know, another part of the question was around insurer consolidation impacting MGAs. I think the bigger, fewer insurers will have MGA operations. Aviva, Intact, these big aggregating insurers all support MGAs as a way of keeping the market healthy, creating innovation, filling gaps, allowing them to do what they want to do in their core operations. So I think the fewer bigger insurers will support MGAs through quota share and subscription, much as Lloyd's does. I think the excess and surplus lines market already exists. That's why MGAs are, are present and have a viable runway. And I think MGAs have a long-term viable structural place in the market to give choice and brand and responsiveness and operate at a scale level that allows them to operate in the few hundred million size rather than the multi-billion size. Excellent, thank you. And, and to that uh, long-term fourth pillar, um, obviously the hard market has driven a lot of the growth in the last few years, but as we get out of the hard market, whatever that might be, um, do you see the MGAs really playing in that innovative space, that list of uh, areas you just mentioned? 
Yeah, Paul, I think you've got some thoughts on this to share around InsureTech and shape of the market and viability. I know, you know, a lot of what Lloyd's is looking for now is digitally future focused business models. Um, so maybe around the innovation side, some thoughts from the Lloyd's perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I suppose the first point is just, and just following on from, from a number of the other comments, is that we are absolutely seeing a healthy pipeline of new new cover holders, um, writing a whole mix of different uh, lines of business and also bringing, bringing different distribution um, methods uh, to, 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 to the market. I mean, last year alone, we, we dealt globally with 230 new either new cover holders or new cover holder uh, lo locations. And I think that just gives a real sense of the vibrancy of, of, of the market. But, um, but in terms of innovation and product development, we definitely see MGAs as being on the, on the, on the front foot and, and leading so, so much of that. And, and so some of the examples that, that, that Cam gave earlier, absolutely we are seeing that and parametric cover is is a really um, key example of that, and we're seeing cover holders with systems that, for instance, can interface directly with banks for for faster insurance payments based on clearly defined defined triggers, and 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 those are coming through. And we we operate at Lloyd's um, something called our, our our innovation lab, and and through that mechanism, we we are really looking for um, potential new and innovative distribution. Um, me methods and, and seeing if we can if we can fast track those those in, into the into the market, and I think the speed to market and the agility that the MGAs can bring is 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 something that's really really significant, and certainly we are developing what we're calling a cover holder in a box um, approach. So where you do have innovative new cover holders, maybe those who aren't perhaps traditional insurance intermediaries. That we can we can help on board them, and we can help on board them quite quite quickly if they've got that really um, great innovative innovative idea. And all of this is notwithstanding the, the key benefits that I still see MGAs having, which is that they are so often our 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 people on the ground, and you just can't get away from the importance that that has. You know, so often, particularly for our say consumer and SME customers. Um, our, our cover holders and indeed our claims administrators will be will be the face of Lloyd's to, to to so many of our customers worldwide. So I think the combination of that ability to bring innovation, bring new ideas, but also to bring the on the ground knowledge and expertise and, and customer service, it makes for a really compelling mix, I think, for for MGAs beyond the headline of, 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 it, of it being a distribution route. There's so much more. And I think that as a cover holder, you can really start to drill into and think about, well, what are the benefits? What am I bringing that there's a carrier, particularly a carrier based in London, um, just, just would really struggle to, to replicate? Understanding your customers means that you can develop products and policies and distribution methods that are absolutely on point that, that will really speak to what, what your customers need. And, and you can't underestimate the importance of that to, to a carrier. Excellent. Now you mentioned the innovation lab, uh, one that uh, I had heard uh, in one of Mark's sessions about the innovation lab uh, that is launching now and certainly topical uh, with COVID was parcel. And I don't know if Mark, you wanted to touch on that, but uh, just well, kind of just, give us no. I mean, I'm not not to make it all about you know an advertisement for, for Parcel, but but a good example of <clears throat> something that started off like an MGA, not not even to Paul's point, entirely focused on insurance. But Parcel was a company whose real focus was about trying to figure out ways to improve. Um, the logistical reliability of the shipment and movement of vaccines around the world, particularly to less developed areas where, um, you know, the distribution chain wasn't as reliable. And how do they make sure that when vaccines that are in high demand move, that they actually get to where they need to go to and they're still in a usable condition? And, you know, they came to the Lloyd's lab really just with that idea in mind. They're not really sure 
how to connect to the insurance industry, but thought that there really was a, likely a strong connection. They were, you know, um, along the lines of CAMS list, they were really focused on IoT, right? On, on, you know, putting sensors in with the vaccine so they can monitor the state of the vaccine all the way through the distribution channel, the shipments. <clears throat> and, and, you know, what Lloyd's realized was how valuable that technology could be in support of underwriting and for, you know, what would be, you know, a, a, a very altruistic purpose, right? Vaccine security and, and shipping. Um, and, and it kind of just, it just springboarded from there. Quickly, Parcel became an MGA. Um, from MGA, the support that they got from different syndicates and the market in general was so great that they actually used another one of Lloyd's recent innovations called Syndicate in a Box, which is a streamlined kind of fast track way to become a syndicate. They became their own syndicate, supported again by other longer term market participants within Lloyd's. And so now, you know, they're deploying their technology, they're helping to find capacity and underwrite the risk of the distribution of the COVID vaccines all around the world. Um, you'll hear in the news a lot about the, uh, the multinational effort to, to share vaccines to less developed countries. Um, th that's parcel behind all of that, ensuring that, making sure that's possible. So it's a great story. It begins with you know an MGA or even a company that thought they could be an MGA but weren't really sure. And, and, you know, and, and an exceptional example of partnership with Lloyd's that led to where they are today. So um, appreciate that, Brad. It's a great example of, of, of the possible, right, within Lloyd's. And Paul, maybe you might want to add to that, but. No, I, 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 th I, think, I think that's, that's um, a, a, a great example of, of how, we can, how we can work with a, with a partner who perhaps hasn't quite um, worked out the exact way of inter interacting with with the market, and that is definitely something that we want to we want to in encourage. You know, the sooner that we can have even informal conversations, and we can start to work work with you, and particularly through through Mark and your office. The, the other thing I should I probably should have just mentioned is in terms of the MGA approval process, is that we also have different levels of approval. So it might be that you don't necessarily have to have complete freedom over rate and form to, 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 to start with. So sometimes, particularly if, if it's a more of a mass distributed product, that we can we can we can adjust our approval process to, to bring you in quicker. And then as you as you learn Lloyd's, if you like, um, then your your level of authority can grow over time. So you don't necessarily need to be um, have everything covered off to start with. You need to have enough to be able to trade safely to start with, but we can definitely um, put you on a journey towards complete MGA status, if, 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 if you'd like. Okay. Well, that's a lot of great conversation around the opportunities, but I also know that uh, we've been reading about uh, the more focused on performance management over the last year at Lloyd's and some initiatives like uh, Lloyd's Desktop Plan Approach. And I just wondered, Paul, if you would like to touch on any of that for our participants. I mean, I can touch on this really quite quite briefly. Um, so it, it, we, we've, we've definitely um, had a considerable focus on underwriting discipline um, at Lloyd's, because I think the comment was made earlier, other carriers have as well. And to be absolutely clear, you know, we make no apologies for our focus on underwriting uh, per performance, and it remains a core strategy of Lloyd's. But what I would absolutely say is that good MGAs will always find a home in the Lloyd's market. And I think that's really an example where the Lloyd's broker really can, can, add, can add, add, add value. And as, I've, as, as we've given some examples during the course of, of this session about, about the pipeline of business and the opportunities that, that, that are coming in there, but underwriting performance absolutely has to remain front and center of our focus. And that is why um, when, when we see an application, we do need to explore in some detail what the underwriting proposition is and talk with the applicant, talk with the broker, talk with the lead syndicate, and really, really understand that. Because to 
one one important thing from my perspective is these should be long-term partnerships we're not looking for cover holders who are going to come in and maybe you know only be with us for a, a, a few years and then move on we want um long-term sustainable business um that's um ideally accretive to to the to the lloyd's market but certainly um people with with an underwriting plan um that is long-term sustainable because we want this to be a long-term partnership so it's it's absolutely right that our focus will remain um on on underwriting performance and i'm sure long-term partnership will uh make a lot of people smile to hear that because in these market times uh it's a pretty tough market out there. So I'm sure everybody would appreciate that. Just on a personal note, we're coming out with a new AI and data paper. And there's a lot of discussion in there around the internet of things. And Paul, you'd mentioned earlier that there's been 230, I think was the number you mentioned, of new syndicates uh, that you've evaluated over the last year. How many of those are playing in that space that uh, Cam talked about, like that AI, data, internet of things? What, could you give us a feel for what that, that's like as far as uh, new people coming to you? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I, I can't give you, I, I, I don't have to hand a, a sort of breakdown of that other than it's increasing. <laughs> I mean, that's, 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 that's what I'd say. So that that's 230 um, and it's made up of a combination of completely new cover holders to the Lloyd's market or um, because we, we 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 separately approve if, if you're opening up a new branch or a new location in a different territory um we regard that as being a, a, a new approval because there's a whole bunch of specific things that we need to check um so whilst i can't give you a number what i can say is that we are definitely seeing and, and the innovation lab has actually been a really good enabler of this of starting to see um a growth of non-traditional um type of type of M mga mga business um but also i think it's quite difficult to draw a, sh a, a, a distinct line sometimes because yes we do have those parametric um, mgas where you can say yeah absolutely that's that's playing in the new innovative space but often the innovation can be more subtle than that it can be around changing the policy wording or or or, or, or developing some new coverage that others others haven't thought of and so there's, there's 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 a whole there's a whole mix. So innovation doesn't always have to be big shiny tech. It can be. I've actually got an idea that's specific to my my retail brokers, my my book of business, and that that's what I'm bringing uh, to, to 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 the table to, to to the carrier. So sometimes I think people can get a bit frightened when they hear about these sort of tech things and think that they've got to go and invest loads of money in big shiny technology and that isn't always the case it's it's as much about the it's as much about the business proposition and and being agile on your feet around what you're offering in terms of coverage as well again first relationships now you don't have to invest a whole bunch of money in tech i i think we're going to want to hear more from you in the future that's fantastic, Paul. And, and again, I think everything we're talking about here, that entrepreneurial spirit, um, that's what we were talking about with bringing certainty to the uncertain times. If you can get the delegated authority, you can move forward with some of these entrepreneurial ideas, build a relationship, have a long-term partnership, and move your business forward. And that's what I was hoping that our participants today could get a, a feel for. Uh, we've got a couple minutes left. Uh, I don't know if uh, Mark, Cam, Paul, if either of you or any of you have uh, something you'd like to leave the participants with. I'll just, I'll say one thing on that last note of yours, Brad. You know, uncertain times mean period of change. Period of change means opportunity. Um, the great thing about the MGA platform is that it fosters entrepreneurism. It, you know, gives people in insurance an opportunity to have their, you know, ensure tech moment or to have their their business building moment and, you know, players like existing MGAs and Lloyd's and CAMGA and the Insurance Institute are all here to support that kind of innovation in our industry. I think, you know, just to, to give Lloyd's credit, um, what they what they did on that vaccine distribution MGA now syndicate in the middle of a hard market, in the middle of the decile 10, in the middle of all the other work that's being done, shows that they haven't lost that DNA to support entrepreneurism. And, and this is our side of the market. There's 
big corporate giants and then there's entrepreneurs who survive in ecosystems and this is the entrepreneurial ecosystem for MGAs and insurance and you know there's lots of opportunity for people with ideas to stick your hand up and and have your moment. That's fantastic. Thanks, Cam. Mark? I was just going to say, I'm blushing. Thank you, Cam. Um, <laughs> you know, I think, you know, I think all I would leave with, I know we're, we're getting close to the hour here, is um, we have talked about a lot, um, a lot about, you know, I guess Lloyd's process. Um, if people are interested in finding out more, the, the natural first place to come is, is to us here in Canada, Lloyd's. Um, so, so, you know, reach out to me, reach out to my colleague, Asim Asagi. We're happy to talk in more detail um, at, at, a, at a bit more manageable pace that's easier to digest. And we can run through the process. So look forward to maybe having some of the discussions in the days and weeks to come. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. And Paul, any last comments for our participants? Uh only to thank you um, for the opportunity to talk about uh, what I think is such an exciting part of uh, of our market. So yeah, it's been been great to to be here. Um, I see that there was a question actually from 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 Gary, um, and perhaps it would be okay if we pick that up um, separately. Um, uh, I see there's a question in the chat chat there, um, but uh, we we can we can we can reach out out directly on that. Um, but as I say, th thank you very much for the opportunity. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to continuing to, to work um, to support our Canadian Coverholder Network. Well, thank you. And to all of our panelists today, thank you so much for your time, your guidance, your expertise and giving us a good idea of how the market works today and a great insight into what the future of that marketplace might look like. And to all of our participants, thank you very much for investing your time with us today. I would like to learn, if you would like to learn more about the MG courses we're offering, that will be uh, attached to the follow-up of this recording. But most of all, I just wanted to say thank you so much to everybody for joining us today. Have a great day, stay safe, and goodbye.